It's early January 2024, and our little home at the top of the hill is being battered and buffeted by the wind. When I went out for a walk earlier this week, it was very blowy. I didn't want to make too many unrealistic New Year's resolutions this year, but I have set myself the goal of going for more walks. It's something I really enjoy, but it's all too easy not to prioritise it. Here in England, we're at the tail end of Storm Henk. Luckily, it hasn't been too devastating where we live, but it's still caused leaves and paper to whirl around madly, and my hair's been trying to achieve lift-off every time I step outside. This week, I've seen dog walkers trying to control restless pets, and neighbours huddled inside coats trying to get to the corner shop without blowing away. We think a lot about the destructive power of water, but we shouldn't forget the effect wind can have too. It's easy to see why our ancestors ascribed particularly persistent gusts to supernatural forces. There are all sorts of folk beliefs about wind, from the ancient Greek personification of the four winds, the Animoi, Zephyrus, Boreas, Notus and Eurus, to the idea that a sudden fierce blast of wind is the work of the fairies. In some parts of the world, it's believed that all winds are born on Christmas Eve and baptised before Epiphany. So we're right at the time of the wind's baptism, when they're at their most vigorous. Weather of all kinds has always influenced agrarian life, and sailors in particular have always been at the mercy of the wind and its whims. I certainly won't be setting out to sea today, but my story will be whipping up a very magical storm, although not without consequences. So take yourself out for a blustery walk, then come inside, get warm, and gather close around the fire to listen in. Welcome to the Three Ravens podcast. There were three ravens sat on a tree. Down a down, hey down a down. They were as black as they might be with a down. One of them said to his mate, Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the Three Ravens podcast. I'm Eleanor Conlon, and I may have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king. And I'm joined by my co-host, Martin Vaux, who can confirm that for me. I can indeed. All hail Eleanor the first. Martin and I have been attempting to take a bit of time off over the betwixtmas period mm. with slightly mixed <laughs> success. But we've certainly found time for reading, seeing friends and watching films. Still, we're looking forward to the next few weeks as we continue with series three. We've still got eight fascinating historic counties to explore after today before we've completed our first lap around the country. We've discovered such a treasure hoard of interesting folklore, stories, magic and superstitions, and mm-hmm. we're so glad that you're all here to share it with us. We love hearing your stories too, and we're looking forward to sharing some of them at the end of the series in our first Flash Fiction episode. We've had some great entries already, so if you're itching to tell us a tall tale, send us up to a thousand words of original fiction inspired by folklore, and we'll give them a dramatic reading on a special episode. Just send them to us at threeravenspodcast at gmail.com, which is the place to get in touch with us about anything else too. We have some lovely new Patreon subscribers to thank this week too. Thank you so much for your support and welcome to the Conspiracy of Ravens to Cassandra, Laura, Kirsten, Luke and Reese. All hail Cassandra, King of Patreon. All hail Laura, King of Patreon. All hail Kirsten, King of Patreon. All hail Luke, King of Patreon. And all hail Reese, King of Patreon. Now, if you would like to join in the fun on Patreon for exclusive episodes, our monthly newsletter and episodes of the Three Ravens Film Club, please consider subscribing for just $3 a month or $6 a month at patreon.com forward slash Three Ravens podcast. We'll talk correspondence at the end, but we also have something special to share from a special boggarty friend. Hello and welcome to a Northern Counties Paranormal podcast hosted by Within the Boggart Wood. My name is Tony, and in the podcast I'll be your guide to all things ghostly, with a hefty amount of folklore, myths, legends and history thrown into the mix for good measure. As well as traditional tales and superstitions, I'll be scouring historical archives of some of the lesser-known stories, 
and we'll also be recounting listener accounts of real-life encounters with the weird and wonderful, as well as regaling listeners with results of paranormal investigations. Just look up Within the Boggart Wood on social media, your favourite browser or podcasting platform, or come and visit theboggartwood.uk. See you soon. We've mentioned within the Boggart Wood before on Three Ravens and Boggarts in general. Yes. Not least that the more a Boggart is mentioned, then the more powerful it becomes. Absolutely. And we want this particular Boggart to become the mightiest Boggart of all. So do please subscribe to Within the Boggart Wood, wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends. His voice is so great, mm. honestly. You could listen to him for hours and yeah. really recommend the podcast. And it's also one of the regional accents that we can't do. No, not <laughs> at all. Anyway. One of the many regional accents. Many. That yeah, we can't do. For now, should we start celebrating the what eighth of January? Have we got anything particular to celebrate today? We certainly have. Oh, good. As every agricultural community knows, the eighth of January is Plough Monday, oh. which marks the effective start of the new farming year. Well, happy Plough Monday, and how do we celebrate? Well, although Plough Monday is the beginning of the farming year, it also seems to be something of a delaying tactic (laughs) as there's a great deal of celebration and festivity but not very much work there's a rhyme which told ploughmen what they ought to do which goes plough monday next after that 12th tide is passed bids out with a plough the worst husband is last (laughs) <laughs> Worst husband, I like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> However, it seems that they were all pretty bad husbands because the ploughman would be busy with other pursuits, mm. including the lighting of plough lights, which were candles kept burning in the church to ensure God's blessing on the efforts of farmers. Plough lights were actually banned during the Reformation, really? along with other so-called superstitious practices. Mm. <laughs> but there were still lots of references to ploughs being decorated and taken around local communities to raise money or beg for food and drink. Uh, another opportunity opportunity to sing and dance rowdily until people pay you and drink or coin to go away. An activity which forms the basis of so many excellent English folk customs. I think it says a lot about us as a people, doesn't it? it (laughs) On Plough Monday, farm workers might also dress up in costumes, which might include turning clothes inside out or wearing black or red face paint to take the ploughs around the neighbourhood. Yes. Gangs of people doing this might be known as plough stocks, plough jags, plough witches or plough bullocks. Mm. And they're activities might be more or less disruptive depending on how generous people were willing to be. Yes, if you're familiar with the concept, it's quite a lot like Mischief Night. It's got a few things in common, that's for sure. But there might also be other festivities like dancing, leaping competitions, (laughs) with the highest leap meant to signify how high the corn would grow, Mm -hmm. and planting corn dollies in the first new furrow to ensure a good harvest. Yeah, people would plough them in so they'd have kept the soul of the last harvest in their corn dolly all winter and then plough in on Plough Monday. Exactly. You might also see straw bears dancing about at this time. Mm. We've talked about straw bears before. Yep. Or be able to catch a plough play, which was a specific sort of mummer's play seen for this holiday. And what do we get in a plough play? Well, it's also called a wooing play Ooh. because the basic plot features a wooing sequence with a lady being courted by a series of suitors in addition to the usual features of mummer's plays like the fool, the doctor and the cure, the hero combat fight section and female parts played by men. Well, dancing leaping straw bears and silly plays so sounding very jolly and is plough monday still celebrated in the traditional way anywhere in England. I mean, could we actually experience it for ourselves? Yes, we could. There are quite a few events taking place around England on the 8th of January, so look out for one near you if you're based in England. You might spice a Morris, a straw bear, and certainly the chance to sample some cider and bless the coming year of work. Well, a hearty wassail to that. Now, should we get the county criers out of these costumes and have them ring us into Essex? Let's. is located in the east of England. It's bordered by the North Sea to the east, the Thames Estuary and Kent to the south, Greater London to the southwest, Hertfordshire to the west and Cambridgeshire and Suffolk to the north. It's one of the home counties due to its proximity to Greater London and the county town is Chelmsford, although the largest settlement is Southend-on-Sea. It's low-lying with a flat coastline and has some wonderful areas of outstanding natural beauty, including Epping Forest, Dedham Vale and many picturesque estuaries, wetlands and salt marshes, as well as some huge beaches. 
Martin, do you have any associations with Essex? I mean, I have no personal associations with Essex. I'm pretty sure I've driven through bits of it on the way to other places. And there is a bit of a stereotype association with people from Essex. Uh, Maybe this is just an English thing, but there's a kind of association with fast sports cars... Uh, bleach blonde hair and perhaps not being the most sophisticated in a traditional sense. There was quite I mean? a popular television programme, wasn't there, called The Only Way is Essex, yeah, which that, I've got to confess I've never seen. Yeah, so can't exists. comment on at all, but I know that was popular and possibly helped to perpetrate some of those stereotypes. Yeah, the stereotype has existed for some time, but I imagine it's got absolutely no relation to people from Essex at all. No. <laughs> now, I haven't explored much of Essex, I must say, although we had a very enjoyable day trip to Colchester and spent many hours in the museum Museum in Colchester Castle. Is that in Essex? Yeah. Oh, okay. So I know Essex. Yeah, I've been there. Well, I've been to Colchester at the yeah, very you've been least. To Colchester. And that museum is absolutely fascinating. Oh, it's so good. If you happen to be in the area, really recommend a visit yeah. to that. Lots of amazing history and archaeological finds. Mm. I couldn't find a county motto for Essex. I don't think they have one. Oh, okay. But the Essex flag is pretty splendid and actually quite ancient in origin. It features three Saxon blades or saxes on a scarlet red background. Oh, wow, that sounds quite grand. Bit of a statement. Yeah, definitely. And I think quite indicative of Essex pride. Look at our three knives. Yeah. The county has its own patron saint, in fact, Saint Sed, who was a Northumbrian monk who trained in Ireland. He was sent, he sailed down from Lindisfarne to establish a chapel in Essex, which is still there today in modern Bradwell on Sea. Wow, it survived all this time. Yeah, 12th century chapel That's has survived so cool. all this time. Said was a bit of an anti establishment figure, it's fair to say, who wasn't afraid to speak up and make himself a bit unpopular. I see. He excommunicated a thane for getting into an unlawful marriage and told all the Essex Christians they couldn't accept the Thane's hospitality uh, so they've been excommunicated. It doesn't sound like a recipe for success. Well, unfortunately, King Sigebert, who was the king of Essex at that point, still wanted to go around and visit his friend the Thane. So he did, only to have said turn up and denounce him for telling his death in that house. Oh, that seems a bit harsh. Well, it would have been a bit harsh, except he was right. Oh, dear. Sigebert was murdered, no. and the venerable Bede goes so far as to say it was his own fault for ignoring said. <laughs> So Saint Said, otherwise known as the patron saint of I told you so, <laughs> is now celebrated on Essex Day, which is on the 26th of October. And just to check, did anyone murder Said? Surprisingly, no. Oh, really? He lived a long life and eventually <laughs> just died of plague. Wow! In addition to Saint Said, Essex also has its own county flower, the cowslip, oh. and its own dialect, although this is losing traction nowadays, like a lot of regional dialects mm. in England, in favour of just estuary English, which is a kind of blend of Cockney and pronunciation sure, that's sure. commonly heard. Now, I do know that Essex was an Anglo-Saxon kingdom and one that managed to survive. Yes, so the kingdom of East Sex or East Saxons, basically. Yeah. But we have a lot of pre-Saxon history too. Before the Roman invasion, the territory of Essex belonged to the Celtic Trinovantes tribe. As in the one's old spelling mistake Nennius recorded as New Trojans. Yes. Ah. The Trinovantes tribe definitely existed and likely had absolutely nothing to do with Troy, <laughs> new or otherwise. <laughs> yep. They were a fairly major tribe, in fact, and actually produced their own coinage, Ooh. featuring the image of Adidamares, who was their monarch, and subsequent other rulers. Cool. The town of Colchester dates from the time of the Trinovantes. They had a very large opium or fortified town there with its own mint. Oh, well, that's amazing. The Trinovantes were pretty interesting. They had a lot of conflict with the Catavalloni tribe, who we've spoken about quite mm. a lot before. And eventually the two tribes more or less merged, becoming one. Again, we know this from evidence of coinage. There are Colchester coins from that period with the image of Tashivanus, who was a Catavalloni leader. Right. His coin was being minted in Colchester. Sure. Uh, the Trinovantes stronghold. So by the time the Romans arrived in 43 AD, Colchester was the blended capital of the two tribes. Well, that's really interesting. And then, of course, it became Roman. Exactly. Yes, the Romans took Colchester and rebranded it as Colonia Claudia Victriensis, or the city of Claudius's victory. Yeah, solid bit of marketing there, although a bit of a mouthful, I've got to say. Yeah, a little bit of a mouthful. (laughs) Unfortunately, this uh, glorious city of Claudius 
Claudius's victory did not please the locals. No. And the Trinovantes soon sought help from their northern buddies, the Icenae or Icenae, mm. which is how everyone's favourite flame-haired warrior queen, Boudicca, got involved. Oh, we found out loads of interesting stuff about Boudicca at the Colchester Castle Museum. There's actually a chariot driving simulator there, which I very much enjoyed. Yes, you can pretend to be Boudicca leading the revolt <laughs> if you want to. Very fun. We did it several times. I think it may be intended for children, but we never let that stop us. <laughs> anyway, the revolts that Boudicca led of an army of 120,000 Icena and Trinovante soldiers oh, absolutely decimated madness, Colchester, yeah. which was at the time protected by about 200 Roman soldiers. Yeah, not a fair fight. I'm going to say that. But also, we don't know if it's quite the true story, do we? No, we have Roman accounts of yeah, this. Indeed. And it's, I mean, it's definitely true that Colchester got smashed to bits. Yeah. Whether they exaggerated the numbers to make it look, make them look better. There I, was only 200 of us. And mate. there was 120,000 of her army. <laughs> so not fair. Anyway, the Temple of Claudius was destroyed and a lot of people died. Mm -hmm. The Romans were, it's fair to say, spectacularly unprepared. Yeah. And one of the reasons for this, super interesting, I just discovered this, I I'd failed to pick up on this when we were at the museum, mm -hmm. was that the Roman governor, Gaius Suetonius, Paulinus was actually away at that point, leading an attack of his own on the island of Mona, otherwise known as Anglesey. Wait, what? Is this the massacre of the Druids we touched on in the Druids episode? That's right. No! Suetonius wasn't around to defend against Boudicca because he was wiping out Druids on Anglesey. That is insanely interesting. He oh always gets so excited when we can link up yeah. a storyline and make a connection and go, oh wow, that's from that moment in time. So interesting. That is fascinating. Whoa. So because he was away, basically, yeah. this great tactician, the Boudiccan revolt was able to wreck merry havoc. Oh. <laughs> Oh, After right. Colchester, um, the reports got to Sir Tonius. He hurried back to London, which the rebels had made their next target. But he was actually forced to sacrifice the city to save the province and ran away. Yeah, but he who fights and runs away. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and he did fight another day. Boudicca's revolt continued to St Albans, or Verulamium as it was known then, which they also raised to the ground yes yeah they had a bit of a, a meme going they a did i think we have a tendency these days to see Boudicca as an aspiring war leader even yeah. a bit of a feminist icon definitely but we shouldn't forget that in the destruction of those three settlements it's estimated that about eighty thousand people were killed yeah and you can't blame the eighty thousand people who were killed for all of rome's sins <laughs> it's just not no, right but that was very much the program of the rebels mm, so uh, was essex as a whole left as a bit of a mess after Boudicca's revolt. Oh, it certainly was. But things did settle down a bit into the late Roman period. That's when we get the stories of the birth of St. Helena. Do you remember her? Uh, I can't say I do. Well, she was the archaeologist saint who discovered fragments of the burning bush. She was given loads of funding oh, by the church yeah, to go yeah. on these expeditions. And mm -hmm. she was the mother of Emperor Constantius. I do remember. I expressed some scepticism about whether she really was finding the stuff or if she was just taking the money and bringing home rats random bits and go, oh, no, 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 this is, this is some of the burning bush. Well, hold on to that scepticism because there's <laughs> also a legend that Helena was the daughter of Old King Cole. Oh, really? You, you may know Old King Cole <laughs> from the nursery rhyme. Yeah. Old King Cole was a merry old soul. Well, so they say, yeah. Yeah, so they say. <laughs> we do know that Cole or Coe was a Britonic king. There is such a person. No. Yeah. And there's a folk legend that Colchester was actually named after oh, him. Old King Colchester. Mm. Yeah. In fact, it's more likely to have come from Colchester after the River Colne, which is nearby. <laughs> Naturally, <laughs> Geoffrey of Monmouth goes hard on the King Cole St. Helena story. Of Good course. old Geoffrey. He's so reliable. The best story is the true one. That's yep, basically his absolutely. philosophy. Absolutely. Yeah. He's such a hero. Mm. <laughs> Moving into the Saxon period, though, the first recorded King of Essex is Eshwin, or Though there's some uh, argument about that, and it may have been a chap who hasn't really gone down in history, unfortunately, named Sled. Oh, Sled? Yeah, so we're going to go with Eshwin. <laughs> okay, <sure. laughs> but the Kingdom of East Sex had already been absorbed into the Kingdom of England as the County of Essex before the Norman Conquest in 1066. 
And so what did all that mean for Billy the Conks when he came to conquer Essex? Well, he put up loads of castles, uh, including Colchester Castle on the site you. of the then raised Temple of Claudius, mm. uh, Headingham Castle and Rayleigh Castle for the usual reason of keeping a hostile county in line. Yeah, and, and you know, Essex wasn't uh, that welcoming to Billy the Conks. We kind of skipped through this briefly, but, you know, to repeat it again, Colchester Museum is in the castle. Yes. Like, if you go there, they have created within this castle castle that they've restored and pinned a museum it's an amazing place oh it's fantastic it's got mosaics yeah. it's got you know original bits of architecture there from when it was the temple of claudius as well as all these incredible finds mm -hmm. really good displays yeah. very good museum Stunning. shout out to them yep, yep. <laughs> well things settled down a bit after William the Conqueror and co arrived and yeah. Frenchified everything until <laughs> 1381, when the powers that be had the bright idea of levying a poll tax to fund a war with France. It's funny how poll taxes are never popular. Yeah. <laughs> well, this one wasn't. <laughs> well, just to be clear, a poll tax, in case you're unfamiliar with the idea, is it's something that everyone has to pay. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone has to pay the same amount. It's a poll tax because it's a tax for having a head. That's what it means. Yeah. A poll it's tax. It's a literal tax on your head. Oh, dear. The author of this particular poll tax was probably John of Gaunt, uh -huh. who was the de facto ruler of England at this point, while Edward III was on his sickbed and not really up to much, mm. let alone levying taxes. Taxes. Sure. And it was not popular, yeah. <laughs> especially in Essex, where the Peasants' Revolt actually started in oh, Brentwood. Yeah, OK. So it started in Essex, the Peasants' Revolt. But I've got to say, as far as I remember, the Peasants' Revolt did not go splendidly well for the peasants. No, indeed. Mm. The revolt was very much put down. And Colchester Castle, actually, and Chelmsford were both the scene of many executions of people who'd participated and in the revolt. Still, I mean, you'd think that those in charge would have learned that people do not care for poll taxes by this point in history. Yeah, they have tried them time and time again. Yeah, um, in our lifetime as yeah. well. Mm. <laughs> and still unpopular. We haven't quite had a Peasants' Revolt recently, no. but you never know. <laughs> that's, some, that's some good riots. 2024 that's... could be the year of the Peasants' Revolt. <laughs> Mark 6 or whatever on by now. <laughs> Watch out, Rishi. <laughs> now, before I get stuck into the fascinating folklore of Essex, mm. I do want to mention one more tidbit from its history. Tilbury, which is on the north bank of the River Thames, was chosen as the focal defensive point against the Spanish Armada in 1588. And it was there that Elizabeth I made her famous speech to the troops. Really? I know I have the body of a weak, feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king, and of a king of England too. And think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm, to which rather than any dishonour shall grow by me, I myself will take up arms. I myself will be your general judge and rewarder of every one of your virtues in the field. Cool, blimey. She knew how to make a corking speech, didn't she, old Lizzie the First? So quite a few castles have already come up and it sounds as though there are quite a lot of interesting places worth visiting in Essex. Yes, Essex boasts over 14,000 buildings with listed status. What? Yeah, which means it's got amazingly preserved architectural history. That's insane. One of them is the 7th century church established Established by Saint Said, uh, so the the site is seventh century. Right. The building on that site is a twelfth century building. Still twelfth century. Uh, it's old. called Saint Peter on the Wall, and it's very beautiful. Look at some pictures; it's super mm. atmospheric. We'll pop one up on the blog so you can have a look. Yes. And then we also have Audley End House, Headingham Castle, Colchester Castle, Chelmsford Cathedral, Ingatstone Hall, and I should also give a special mention to the pier at South End on Sea, yeah, which famous. is the longest pleasure pier in the world at over a mile long. So over a mile of pleasure. Yeah, a lot of people love it. <laughs> also worthy of note is the Kelverton Hatch Secret Nuclear Bunker. What? Kelverton Hatch Secret Nuclear Bunker? Not just a nuclear bunker, Eleanor. A secret nuclear bunker. Well, yes. Oh, it, it's, <laughs> let's say it was secret. It's now so not secret that it's actually got a brown sign which points to secret nuclear bunker. Yeah, <laughs> yes. That's very funny. It's buried beneath an unassuming looking bungalow in Kelverton Hatch and it was created and maintained during the 
Cold War as a possible secret government headquarters outside of London yeah. and wasn't decommissioned until 1992, actually. And there are several floors of it. It's a very extensive bunker and it's now a museum you can visit and supposedly incredibly haunted. And I must say, the photographs I've looked at do have a very eerie quality. Oh, that sounds well worth a visit. Now, there's something about all these military sites, isn't there? Yeah, almost all of them seem to have associated ghost stories. Mm. I don't know why the, the government and the military pick these horribly haunted places. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they make them haunted. I think that's do you think the it's their fault? <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, armies are generally quite associated with death, aren't they? That I suppose so. One Although, of the things they're famous for. In a secret nuclear bunker in a country that wasn't invaded, you wonder how much death there really was. Well, maybe if it's dark down there and there's a lot of stairs, you know. Bing, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> you think it's just haunted by the ghosts of people who've had a little accidental <laughs> yes, bumble. Exactly. That would be so sad and <laughs> so underwhelming if you went as a paranormal investigator. No, well, I could be really <laughs> angry about having slipped on the staircase. You know, poltergeist activity and all the rest, having a right old tanty. <laughs> well, speaking about poltergeist activities and indeed right old tanties, that yeah. segues very nicely into my next story, which is about the house called The Most Haunted House in England. I am, of course, talking about Borley Rectory, which once stood in North Essex, almost on the Suffolk border. Ah, the infamous Borley Rectory. Now, I know a little bit about Borley Rectory, not least because your dad is kind of obsessed with Borley Rectory. Yes, he's done a lot of research and he's very interested. So we've, we've picked up a bit secondhand, haven't we? Yeah, so which angle are we going to take into Borley Rectory? Because it is very famous. I mean, made primarily famous by Harry Price, right? Supernatural Yes, researcher. absolutely. So the house has been demolished now, so you can't visit anymore. Yeah. Um, it was claimed that it was haunted ever since it was built. Mm. However, the accounts of the hauntings definitely increased after a visit from Harry Price, Ghost Hunter, who wrote two books about about the paranormal happenings he had supposedly witnessed in the house. Yeah. The basis for the haunting seems to be the classic monk-nun love affair resulting in execution and walling up. Yes. We've encountered quite a lot of these in our reading from various counties. Oh yes, when in doubt, blame a walled up nun. So descriptions <laughs> of the phenomena that various people witnessed at Borley Rectory included writing appearing on the walls and disappearing, people being locked inside rooms, the ringing of bells, things being thrown, including stones yes. and numerous other things. Well, that's kind of where it went wrong, wasn't it, in the end, because Harry Price was actually caught in the act of throwing gravel at a window, trying to simulate that it was poltergeist activity. And that, that kind of was the moment when he was rumbled, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, although not not for a while afterwards. It was a bit later that the Society for Psychical Research conducted an investigation and concluded that most of the phenomena had been faked. Yes. Including by Harry Price. It was quite a scandal and not the only one that Price was involved no, in. No, no, not He's a very interesting figure and it's well worth having a read about him if you're not familiar with his doings. But I don't think it's quite fair to say that England's most haunted house isn't haunted at all because there are some records of some really weird things things actually happening there. There are, but there's been later accounts where the people who were involved in those have come forward and said they faked the whole thing. Oh, no way! Yeah, so Marianne Foister, who was the wife of the reverend who moved in there, um, the, they were the last people that lived there, I think, sure. says, um, before it burned down. She came forward years later and said she'd faked it all. No way! Yeah, they were oh. trying to get money and raise interest in the house. Yeah. And there was a, a man who'd been a little boy and who'd visited and lived there as a child and he said that they were all involved in faking the phenomena. But hold on, wait. Because it's not just like Borley Rectory. There's the church as well. And that's supposed to be haunted. Oh, yeah, that's super haunted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the house wasn't haunted. Yeah. The Bor church was Borley haunted. Borley Church, near nearby the site of the rectory. Absolutely. <laughs> Paranormal research have recorded ghostly organ music, footsteps, tapping, wailing, even photographs of ghostly figures in the churchyard. The church has got the lot. Oh, well, that's a bit more like it. I was feeling very worried for a moment there. I was like, sure, do I know that some of this is meant to be real? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, there are plenty of other ghost stories in Essex to choose from too. Well, and some of them have got to be real. Yeah. There's St. Ossith herself, in fact. Ossith? Yeah, that's her name. St. Ossith. <laughs> It's a Saxon name. I okay, think. sure. She was also a princess. Uh -huh, a right, okay. And she appears at her priory on the 7th of October every single year. Blimey. So 
So don't mock her name if you're yeah, <laughs> rock up there. All right. Osith was beheaded in the 7th century and her executioners were very surprised when she picked up her head and walked with it to the village church <laughs> where she knocked on the door before finally <laughs> collapsing. Oh, my goodness. And at midnight on the 7th of October, you're supposed to be able to see her holding her severed head in the churchyard. Oh, my God. That is, firstly, incredibly gruesome, brilliantly imaginative and exciting. And also, I know what we're going to be doing this 7th of October. <laughs> <laughs> I have a much friendlier ghost too, if you don't fancy old headless Osseth. I mean, um, I, I kind of do. <laughs> but yeah, go on, But this ghost, ghost helps lost people in Epping Forest. Supposedly, she's the ghost of a woman who got lost and died of cold in the winter. Aww. And she now leads lost travellers out of the woods in a very particular way by leaving a trail of fresh lavender flowers to guide them back to the path. Aww. Even when lavender can't flower because it's too cold. That's Isn't gorgeous. that lovely? Yeah, that's lovely. I mean, that is the kind of ghost I would definitely like to meet. I can also offer you the ghost of Leia Marnie Tower, which is an amazing Tudor building. And it's haunted by Lord Marnie, who had it built, but he's unhappy because the construction of the house was never finished to his liking. Was as dark to snuff. No, he's never left. <laughs> but the fun part about his ghost is supposedly it wears full armour and rides his horse up the stairs of the tower, <laughs> no. which must be very clattery. Yeah. Does he have a ghost pony? He has a ghost pony <laughs> and he rides it up the stairs. <laughs> to be honest, Eleanor, talking of ghost ponies, I'm surprised Dick Turpin hasn't turned up yet because, you know, he is our most well-travelled spectre and I imagine he was passing through Essex all the Time. You want Dick Turpin? Yeah. Essex has Dick Turpin. Oh, of course it does. It's quite a good story too. <laughs> there is a cave in Epping Forest, which was supposedly one of Dick Turpin's hideouts uh -huh. and a base for organising lots of criminal activities, of course. Uh, but he was almost rumbled while in Essex by a chap called Thomas Morris, who tried to capture Turpin at this cave. But Turpin shot him, Ooh. presumably incredibly messily, with a hand cannon. Oh, no, this is getting gory. I'm kind of sorry I brought it up. Yeah, I try not to picture that too vividly. Oh. <laughs> of course, though, the thing Essex is most famous for is being witch hunting country because Matthew Hopkins, the self-styled witch finder general, was mainly active in the east of England. Yeah, of course. He lived in Manningtree and Mistley and is known for his horrendous methods of interrogation, torture and accusation of more people than all the other witch hunters in England in the previous 160 years. Oh, such a terrible chapter in our history. And Hopkins' legacy can't really be understated, to No, be because many of his methods had a colonial impact too. Yep. And some are being still used in the New England witch trials of the 17th century. And again, you know, we've talked about this on the podcast, but the man just appointed himself witch finder general. Yeah, he went about telling everyone he was witch finder general, but he didn't have any official standing. No. He wasn't officially appointed. He didn't have to have a job interview or anything. Didn't even write a CV. No, just went riding around drumming and accusing <laughs> hapless people of witchcraft. <laughs> so are there tales of any real witches from Essex? As in, you know, because Hopkins was saying everyone was a witch. Do we have yeah. any interesting cases of magic or people who did notable things in Essex that kind of justified Hopkins' like, passion for witch finding in the area? Well, in addition to the story I'm going to tell today, there's a long history of witchcraft in the village of Canyon, which was obviously not for Matthew Hopkins, as it was called the village where witch finders fear to tread. Oh, that sounds great. I want to go there. A lot of the legends are actually connected to the church, strangely, where it's said that as long as the church tower stands, there will be six witches in Canyon. Oh, this is great. Also, every time a stone falls from the tower, one witch will die and another will take their place. What? The church is also the focus of some running around in circles magic. Mm -hmm. Classic running around in circles magic. Yeah. Seven times around the church will make you see a witch and 13 times will make you invisible, Ooh. which is actually very useful. Yes. But if you run it round it anti-clockwise, the devil will appear. Oh, goodness. Well, I can see why the witch finders want to nothing to do with Canada. Besides witches, we have a ton of dragons, worms and serpenty sorts slithering all over Essex. Well, I mean, not that long ago, it was a very popular novel, wasn't there? The Essex Serpent. So are you telling me that that's actually a work of non-fiction? It, it is fiction, but it seems likely that the author Sarah Perry was inspired by local legends. 
Although Beers is technically in Suffolk, and we talked about the Beers Dragon before, yes. it is very close to the border. And there's also a stained glass window commemorating the Beers Dragon in the church at Wormingford, which is technically in Essex. That, yeah, that cannot be a coincidence as no, well. No, I think it's quite likely that this dragon was roaming around that border area. Yeah, but also the name of the place, Wormingford. Like, well, it quite. Yeah, it's got to be named after the worm, surely. Got to say, though, the dragon depicted in that particular stained glass window looks very like a crocodile Uh-oh. and one of the legends about the Beer's Dragon was that it was an escaped crocodile belonging to Richard the First, sure, which we yeah. did also we talk about, about before yeah, yeah. but it seems like North Essex is decidedly dragon country because in St Mary the Virgin in Whistenton there is another amazing dragon wall painting really large beautiful picture of a dragon cool and there are also some stories of a basilisk type dragon in Saffron Walden described very nicely as follows of being colour between black and yellow, having very red eyes, a sharp head, and a white spot hereon like a crown. It goeth not winding like other serpents, but upright on its breast. If a man touch it, though with a long pole, it kills him. Ooh. And if it sees a man far off, it destroys him with its looks. Crumbs. Furthermore, it breaketh stones, blasteth all plants with its breaths, it burneth everything it goeth over, and no herb can grow near the place of its abode. I mean, the best part of that is a sharp head. <laughs> <laughs> what an image <laughs> anyway this nasty sharp headed creature yes. devastated Saffron Walden to the point that the town was in danger of becoming severely depopulated well, I can imagine so, by yeah. this sharp headed fire breathing nightmare <laughs> luckily a wandering knight came along and had the bright idea of covering his armour in crystal glass Clever. which meant the horrible sharp headed basilisk saw its own reflection and died see that sounds a lot more involved than just holding up a mirror like this knight decided ah, what could I do what could I do I know bejazzle myself yeah but imagine how awesome he looked in crystal armour <laughs> yeah. I mean who wants to have a statue of themselves just holding up a mirror when you could look absolutely yes, amazing that's true <laughs> I'm glinting darlings I'm glinting <laughs> basilisk oh. <laughs> now as everybody knows by now I am much more of a dog person than a snake person yeah. so I'm happy to say that Essex has some dog legends too. Cool. Black Shuck terrorises nearby Suffolk and Norfolk, of course, but Essex has its own shucks, including Old Shuck, a rather friendlier version of your classic big black dog, who's known to appear to lone women walking at night to escort them safely home. Oh, what a good boy. That's really great. <laughs> there are two more, though, at Pitsy Mount near Basildon, a pair of ghostly hounds known as the Black Shucks of Basildon. They appear on Pitsy Mount around the ruins of the 13th century St. Michael's Church, and they were last spotted in the 1980s. And they were described as being a pair of dogs, very large, with red eyes, who chased the people who saw them before vanishing. That's so interesting. I always thought that Shuck was a specific black Shuck from Norfolk and Suffolk. But it seems like this is a whole kennel of shucks in that part of the world. Mm. Do you reckon they were breeding at this yeah, at some I think, point? Yeah, I think that's where the pedigree comes from. <laughs> now, I can't not mention the charming folk custom held every year since the 12th century in the town of Dunmo. The legend goes that the lord of the manor, Reginald Fitzwalter, and his wife dressed themselves as common people after a year and a day of marriage and went to see the local prior for a blessing. The prior was so impressed at their devotion to each other that he awarded them a side or a flitch of bacon. When Lord Fitzwater revealed his true identity, he gave his land to the priory on the condition that a similar flitch of bacon should be given to any couple who could claim they were similarly devoted. Well, I like this. This is very, very wholesome. But I'm just, you know, I'm speaking to any priests or anyone involved in the church right now who happens to be listening to the podcast. If you gave out free bacon, I think it could be a very effective way of getting more people to attend. Well, the Dunmo flitch trials still survive today and lots of people attend. So if you and I wanted to say win a large amount of bacon. Which we do. We just need to present ourselves this February and compete for it. Oh, it's incredibly wholesome. Think of the sandwiches, Eleanor. Think of the sandwiches. It's too wholesome, really. I, mm. I think I'm going to have to finish with a rather more atmospheric bit of folklore before I get stuck into my story. OK, I'm ready. This is the legend of a large barrow hill in West Mersey, sometimes known as Mercy Mount, or more poetically, Grimm's Hoe. <laughs> Sorry? What? <laughs> Grimm's Hoe? Presumably whole. Oh, I see. Right, yeah, yeah, with you. 
It's the tale, Martin, to be serious, of a tragic love triangle from the Danish occupation period, which tells of two twin Danish brothers who spent the winter in Mercy and both fell in love with the same woman who they'd carried off. Right. Um, she was an English woman. She, she wasn't Grimm's hoe. <laughs> No. Legend does not inform. <laughs> anyway, their love turned into wild jealousy and they fought to the death and killed each other. Oh, dear. Probably for the best, you might think, until some of their friends turned up and decided it was this poor woman's fault. Oh, no. So they buried the two dead brothers and the living woman in the barrow. No. All three of them haunt the barrow to this day in this manner, recorded by uh, the priest and folklorist Sabine Baron Gould, who was a great source of folk tales yeah. in the 19th century. When the new moon appears, the flesh grows on their bones and the blood staunches, the wounds close and breath comes back behind their ribs. And if you listen at full moon on the hoe, you can hear the brothers fighting below in the heart of the barrow. You hear them curse and cry out, and you hear the clash of their swords. But when the moon wanes, the sounds grow fainter. Their armour falls to bits, their flesh drops away, the blood oozes out of all the hacked veins, and at last, all is still. Oh, that's genuinely a bit chilling. My hairs have stood up on my arms. Well, even worse, the ghost of the woman they fought over, who we're going to call Grimm's Ho, is said to be heard <laughs> weeping from the time of the new moon to the full moon. And then she goes silent as they fight. The fight can never be resolved because the brothers are twins. So they're the same age, the same size and the same strength. So one can never conquer the other. OK, I've got to be honest. I do not want to go there after dark. Or, to be honest, at any phase of the moon. It just sounds like a <laughs> horrid place. <laughs> well, Essex is absolutely full of wonderful stories. But this one is a version of a folktale I've come back to many times over the years. It's called Three Knots. And I'll start spinning my yarn right after this. The wind is a wild soul and hard to tame. It cannot be pinned for long and it laughs away every attempt. Even those who think they can contain it have their spirits broken, for the wind will always dance away. People who can control its rough magic are few and you may never meet one. One such soul was Sarah Moore. She knew the secrets of the wind and some of the secrets of the sea as well, although it has too many to ever know fully. Gulls perched on her shoulders and told her tales of their flights to distant shores, and shimmering fish jumped from the water to giggle at her jokes. Sarah Moore was strong and tall, and the four winds liked to play in her storm-grey hair. She had quick, clever fingers, and she wove charms from colourful wool and twisted net fibres. Sarah's speciality was harnessing the wind into her knotted charms, which she gave to sailors to afford them a little extra help. The knots she wove were intricate and beautiful, and each charm was like a tiny picture of something nobody could fully see, the dance of the wind. She created many different sorts, but the one she most often gave to others was a charm of three knots. Three knots Sarah tied into her charms and each knot had a different purpose. A sailor could carry her charm aboard and, as needed, untie a knot. The release of the first knot would produce a light breeze, just enough to catch the sails of a ship at first. The second knot let out a strong wind which could carry a ship to its intended point much faster. But Sarah always tied a third knot into her charms, a balance of sorts, which she told sailors never to use. Within that third knot, a storm was contained, and if it was released, it might rage unchecked until it had claimed something from the seas. Most people listened to Sarah when she warned them not to use the third knot, but there are always exceptions. For instance, I heard of a man over from Sheerness who used one of Sarah Moore's charms. I don't know why he'd come to Lee on Sea to do his wife's shopping, but he had a list and he'd made the trip. The shopping was done quickly and cheaply, and this man decided he'd spend the rest of his day in the quayside inns. Still, when the sun started to get low, he thought he'd better start for home to avoid angering his good lady. 
Worry beset him when the waters were calm, with no wind to catch a sail. Luckily for him, Sarah Moore was walking along the quay, feeding the seabirds, and she offered to sell him a charm. Just like she always did, she told him never to use the third knot, and he nodded and he paid her. Well, this chap was just delighted. He released the knot and a light breeze fluttered through his sails and set him on course to sail back to Sheerness. He was enjoying the sunset, looking over the bows when he thought it was still quite a distance home and that he might just have a little more wind just to help him get along a little faster. So he took out Sarah's charm and he untied the second knot. Oh, didn't he get along beautifully then? The ship cut through the water like a cormorant skimming along the surface and this man thought there was nothing better. He decided he'd never do the shopping anywhere but Lee on Sea. But the sun had dipped well and truly below the horizon by then and he thought of his wife waiting back home in Sheerness, wanting the things he'd bought and he thought perhaps he'd just have a little more speed just to get home faster. Sarah's charm had worked so beautifully up until now that he could just imagine how it would be with a little more wind. So he let out the final knot and held onto the mast, ready to fly into Sheerness port like a shooting star. Well, just as he'd been warned, a fearsome storm blew up. It battered and buffeted at his ship, and he had a job to cling onto the mast. He was lucky not to be sunk or dashed to pieces, but on that occasion, the wind fiercely blew the ship off course, away from Sheerness and all the way back to Lee on Sea. And who should be waiting for him on the quayside but Sarah Moore, with her hands on her hips and a smile on her face, and what did she say but I told you so. But most of the time, the people who used Sarah's charms listened to her words and were well satisfied with the service. Of course, it wasn't free. Magic had a price, and Sarah Moore charged it happily. Selling her spells kept her cottage by the sea well supplied with salty fish and red-heeled shoes, and it was a happy place filled with pretty shells and gull's feathers and dangling charms made of sea glass. Most days she sat outside on the Lee Harbour side, talking to the winds and watching the ships, and selling her charms to anyone who wanted them. The people in Leon Sea accepted Sarah Moore as part of the scenery, as much a feature of their landscape as the sea or the sky. But one day, a foreign ship sailed into Lee. A mercenary crew had come to patrol the seas and keep them safe from the threat of invasion. The captain was a solemn, cold man who had read the words of Matthew Hopkins and others, and when he looked at Sarah Moore with her twists of thread and her chattering birds, he only saw a witch. When he passed her on the quay, he spat at her feet, and he told his men not to buy her charms at any cost. About the town of Lee, he spread vicious rumours about Sarah, telling people that she'd sold her soul to the devil and that the seabirds she fed were her hellish familiars. At first, nobody listened, but the insidious talk gradually spread, and the sailors and fishermen who'd bought charms from Sarah for years started to avoid her too. Sarah soon found that people stopped saying good morning to her, and she wasn't welcome in the pubs she always went to. Even the landlady of the Bent Bowsprit Inn, who'd been her friend, was rude to her, and Sarah started to feel as though Lee on Sea wasn't the happy home it had always been. It didn't take very long for her to trace the problem back to the foreign captain. His rude remarks and the way he crossed himself whenever he passed her or clutched at his silver crucifix and the way he pointed at her and muttered things to his crew, oh, he was the source of it all right. Now, Sarah Moore was no wallflower, so she lost no time in marching up to the captain's ship the next time it was in dock and confronting him. But he didn't have the grace or the face to speak to her. He turned away and shut himself in his cabin and wouldn't meet her eyes. You'll see, said Sarah Moore. You'll see for she was full of a tearing fury, spiralling through her like a whirlwind, and she vowed to have her revenge on the foreign captain and his shipmates. The captain opened his sea chest 
and looked into his book of Maleficium. And after long hours of pondering, he had an idea of what to do about Sarah Moore. But he kept it to himself for a little while, in case nothing happened at all. After all, the coldness of old friends is sometimes enough to send someone away from the home they've loved. But Sarah wasn't to be seen off so easily. Her anger was growing as rain swells a dark cloud. The next overcast day, when the captain sailed his ship out to patrol the estuary, Sarah Moore stood on the quay with a bundle of threads in her hands. As she stared at the ship, she twisted the threads into a new dark shape, not her usual three knots, but a tangled bramble-spiked knot of malice. And she tossed that oily dark thing into the air until a whispering wind caught it and carried it right to the top of the mast of the captain's ship. There it tangled itself around and around, and when Sarah Moore spoke some words to it, it stuck fast as though it had been carved into the grain of the wood. The knot began to glow, drawing the storm clouds around itself in a web of wind and rain, until it was the eye of a fearsome storm which raged only about that ship, for Sarah Moore had no anger in her heart towards the other sailors and fishermen of Lee. But around the bows of that ship, the estuary churned and roared. The crew clung to the masts and the bows, their stomachs rolling as they went for the barrels of rum, vowing not to die sober if they had to go that day. The captain stood at the wheel, and as he looked back towards Lee, he saw Sarah on the shore, and he knew that the time had come to put into practice the things his Book of Maleficium had told him. He knew that a witch needs a connection a magical link to the spell she's cast. So he looked around for the source of the raging wind and rain, and he saw the glowing knot at the top of the mast. All in a trice, he ran to fetch the great axe he kept in his cabin, a relic from another life, and he swung it back and chopped into the ship's mast as though he were cutting down a great tree in a forest. Righteous fire fueled his strokes, and in three chops the mast was toppling from its great height and crashing into the waves below. As soon as the mast hit the surface of the water, the storm stilled. The sailors cheered the bravery of their captain, and they didn't mind that they had to row all the way back to the harbour, for they all knew how close they'd come to dying that day. They knew that the burn in their muscles from pulling at the oars would soon be relieved by strong liquor and prayers of thanks that their captain's foresight and knowledge had saved their lives. But when they arrived back at the quay and Lee, there were no bright smiles or words of welcome for their safe return. Instead, they found a group of people gathered around a fallen shape lying near the harbour wall. It was the dead body of Sarah Moore, lying in a pool of her own blood, with three great axe wounds sliced across her chest. Nobody in Lee knew exactly what the captain had done, but they knew he was to blame. It didn't take long before they forgot that they'd listened to him and colluded in Sarah's misfortune. Lee on sea made it quite clear that the captain wasn't welcome there anymore, not in any of the pubs, and nor were any of his crew. Soon enough, they set sail for other waters, and they weren't seen again in those parts. The landlady of the Bent Bowsprit Inn changed its name to the Sarah Moor, in honour of the Witch of the Winds, and it remains named for her to this very day, though it's a long time now since she sold her charms by the sea there. Many a sailor has wished he held three knots in his hand to unleash a wind and many more has longed for the spells Sarah wove to keep them safe at sea. But as for Sarah, she lives on in the winds which lift the waves into carrying ripples and in the fluffy clouds which darken with the rain. If her spirit takes a fancy to a handsome seafarer, she might help a ship along by blowing a breeze through its sails. But too much zealotry and cold looks aboard and Sarah Moore might just knot her spirit around the mast and whip up a fatal storm. And so my tale is told, and now it belongs to you. (laughs) 
So, Martin, what do you think of Sarah Moore and her three knots? Well, it's a really interesting story. I've heard the three knots story before, like the, the one that you did early on in the story. Yeah, so the version I've told before is just the shopping story. Yeah. Basically, these guys come and they want to do some shopping and then they think they can be a bit smart and yeah, <laughs> it doesn't yeah, work out for them. Yeah, they started. Yeah, pay the consequences. It's a, like a cute little story, but I've never heard of Sarah Moore before. Well, no, and it seems to be this version of Three Knots that's very peculiar to this place. And, and the Sarah Moore pub is real. It stands to this day. You can go. Whoa. And the pub is supposedly named after this woman, this, this wind witch. That's so cool. Because obviously there are lots of witches associated with the wind. You know, we talked about this before. Mother Shipton, probably the most famous one. But, you know, a lot of witches that made predictions about storms, wind, rain. People often thought that witches could control the weather. Yeah, we see it, don't we? Shakespeare's Macbeth, I'll give you a wind. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's just kind of common knowledge that witches have this affinity to wind. And so with that in mind, do we know when this witch, Sarah Moore, lived? We don't know for sure, no. I'm going to assume tool ship time, yeah. so probably 17th century, looking well, that, at Dutch wars. Yeah. That might have been, you know, when they were people patrolling the estuary of the coast though, That does line up with, you know, witch hunt fever. Well, it does. <laughs> that's it and that's why i've sort of popped in that reference yeah. because that was that was when i thought the story most likely took place How fascinating and three axe blows what a nasty way to yeah, go yeah it's an unusual ending isn't it and it's it's not a particularly happy ending for anybody no because the captain's not exactly happy yeah. and sarah poor sarah moore's dead but i i wanted her to have a bit of an afterlife as, as weather <laughs> yeah yeah sure well that's really nice thank you alan that's super super and maybe one day we can have a drink in her pub yeah maybe we can <laughs> that'd be really nice wouldn't it so, are you ready to talk correspondence? I am. Let's have it. Okay, well, the first thing to say is, we've had a new review! Heavens to Betsy! How exciting! Yeah, we did hear from Linda, who messaged us to say that she'd written us a review on Apple Podcasts that just hasn't shown up. So, thank you to Linda for trying. And apparently that's just something that happens with Apple Podcasts on iTunes sometimes, which is deeply deeply annoying oh, how frustrating yeah they but should a, fix that they should but a new one did appear from sam lc69 who wrote love this podcast one of my favorite podcasts to listen to always looking forward to new episodes you both are amazing well that's very nice it thank is. you sam lc69 yes thank you and please as ever dear listener if you have five minutes do hop onto itunes apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcast to drop us some stars and if possible write us a review everyone really really does help other people to find the podcast. Elsewhere, thank you so much to everyone who sent us lovely New Year's messages, including Helen, Robert, Donna, Kurt, Sam, Samuel, Linda, Ian and Andy. Thank you also to John, Patty and Ruth for their lovely art and very interesting posts on the Three Ravens podcast group on Facebook. And Mary, who shared an awesome video of people singing in an underground cave system yes. off the back of our discussion on the Three Drummers Drumming Advent mini episode. So cool. And as for our likers comments, commenters and super sharers this week particular thank yous to paul pamela charles donna and michelle on facebook louis laura zizza zaza hedgebound england and mothers of weird wednesday on instagram and paco sheila mary ellen brady mystic moon and the weird side podcast on twitter thank you all so much for all your lovely communications please keep them coming yes. <laughs> get in touch with us via social media that's facebook.com forward slash three ravens podcast instagram at three ravens podcast and x at three ravens pod or you can email us at three ravens podcast at gmail.com which is also the place to send us your entries for our thousand word flash fiction competition mm -hmm. and where will we be wandering to next week martin we will be wandering to the very very small county of rutland on monday but before then we'll be back on thursday with a new best year episode all about the mythical sea creature the selkie until next time then while our story's gone that way we'll go this way and remember don't whistle until you're out of the woods thanks and credit go to folklore of essex by sylvia kent essex folktales by jan williams and the liminal shore witchcraft mystery and folklore of the essex coast by alex langston our theme song is the traditional folk ballad Three Ravens, performed by Eleanor Conlon and Ben Harbour. And our logo is by Ollie James Dare. The Three Ravens podcast is a Rust and Stardust production, produced by me, Martin Vaux. Thanks for listening. God sent every gentleman, such hounds, such hawks, and such lean man, with a down, derry, 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 down.